Okay, let's get started. You got that email from uh, the TA about the final, right? Uh, Midterm, mid sorry, it stand corrected. Uh, I gave you the wrong date on that. Uh, C is correct. Uh, it's the date C gave you, okay? We're going to finish this uh, class on carbon MEMS uh, today. Uh, you remember I gave this class because it's a very nice application of lithography, plus it introduces these additional uh, manufacturing techniques, this electro spinning. Now, before getting to the point I left this off yesterday, I want you to remember two expectations we had of this material uh, we are building in pyrolysis. You remember there was an amount of shrinkage we expected. How did that work? The amount of shrinkage during carbonization. 80%, right, if you're at a small, certain small dimension. That was number one. And the other expectation was and that it would be glassy. And then we had come to the point, huh, turns out it's very different. And so now we're going to try to understand why when you convert a bulk block of uh, a polymer like a photoresist by pyrolysis into carbon, that suddenly these two rules are violated. What's behind that, right? That was kind of the scientific mission we were after. So we had come about here, right? Where an experiment is done with far field electro spinning. So you remember how that works, right? Far field electro spinning. We have this nozzle coming out of a, a syringe. In the syringe, we have a solution of a polymer. And about 10 to 15 centimeters away from your syringe tip, you have a counter electrode. You apply this big voltage. And when the electrostatic voltage is so big that the bubble on that syringe transforms into a Taylor comb, you start jetting a polymer stream, stream to the surface. Now, normally, that's just a mat you're creating. And we are trying to go from that mat to the single fibers that we can connect end to end. That was the goal. And so one step towards that goal was work we did at UNIST in uh, South Korea and uh, was actually also guided by Ashutosh Sharma at IIT Kanpur, uh, Yoon Chung, sorry, who's uh, the PI of the project in uh, UNIST, uh, and Swati Sharma, who's your TA. Uh, this was actually her experiments. What she did, instead of having a stable substrate to uh, electrospin towards, she used the drum. And this drum is rotating very fast. And on that drum, she put her sample. So the sample you see there is a piece of silicon. And of the piece on a piece of silicon, I have these walls. And now, when I start spinning, the fiber can go hang over these walls, right? Because you mount the walls perpendicular to the rotation movement. And so she did that. And she pyrolyzed these structures. And she said, Mark, this does not at all shrink 80 to 90 percent. And so my first thought was, huh, something else is happening here. Take a TEM, a transition electron microscopy picture. And she came back with this result. This is obviously not glassy carbon, right? This is graphite. And so the two rules that we had established in our research that when you do carbonization, that you usually end up with glassy carbon, that depending on the size shrinks dramatically, 80 to 90%, both are violated. What could be behind this? What could be the reason that, you know, the carbonization that we use here is the same 900, 950 degrees C as we use for a bulk sample? Still, the material that comes out is very different. Does anyone have an inkling? What could be behind this? Scientifically, kind of what do you think? What could be your next step in your brain? What's going on? Why would this be? Why would I end up, in this case, making something that has these nicely organized graphite planes? Cause it to align up in that, in a more consistent way? 
you're almost there. It's actually, it's, the field helps, but it's actually just the fact that you're flowing these long polymer chains through this nozzle. So there's a flow pattern. And it's almost like this flow is mechanically templating. So the, it's like the polymer chains now are so nicely organized, lined up together, that when you parallelize, it leads to graphite. So it's like mechanically pre-organizing your polymer chains, and because they're all lined up in the same direction, you get graphite with the planes in that very direction. Now we have a lot of additional research going on, because once we saw that, we really thought we could push this very, very far. Because some of you might have heard about the field of carbon nanotubes. Who has heard about carbon nanotubes? Raise your hand high, I don't see. You know, carbon nanotubes, as you know, for now a few decades, have been seen as a fantastic discovery where maybe instead of electronics based on silicon, we use carbon nanotubes for transistors. But there have been some problems stopping the development of this field. What are these problems? Number one, carbon nanotubes come in all types of shapes and forms. They can be single walled, multi walled, that's one problem. They also are very hard to make a contact or make contact to it. You know, imagine you have this nanotube there and it's really nano and you need to make a contact to it. How will you do that? And we recognize that over here, or maybe we have the ultimate answer. Because look, if I have these two walls, you can see the white lines, and then you see that nanofiber connecting these white lines, right? That is 22 nanometers thick, and it's connected to carbon. It's carbon to carbon, so I automatically have ohmic contact. What is another problem with carbon nanotubes? The length. The length is all over the map. In my case, the length is determined by how far I place the contact. So we started really dreaming widely. So this is a Nobel Prize. We have a new technique to very cheaply make basically graphene cables with always the same distance, or make contact, and as inexpensive as you can imagine. Now, life is never that nice. It doesn't give you these things so easily. Turns out that graphic nature is not through the whole wire. Uh, this picture might have been taken somewhere in the middle of that wire, but we don't have from contact to contact graph graphite. So now in my team, I have at least two or three people really looking to do just what I said, what I predicted, that we would have graphite contact to contact. If we do have that, we in a way have a new world of electronic possibilities, where indeed we make silicon a thing of the past. We use these carbon ribbons as our electronic vehicle. So I'll go through this in a bit more detail now. By the way, we first announced this uh, in a poster session uh, and Swati got the best poster award. We were so eager to announce it to the world and that was in uh, November 2011 in Montreal. Uh, oh, sorry. How is that possible? That's funny. That must be Nanotech 2011, right? So <laughs> there's something inconsistent there. That's good. You guys didn't get it. I got it earlier than you. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the poster was on uh, November 16, 2011. So Montreal Nanotech 2011, obviously. Because at that time, no one had seen that. Now, coming back a little bit to why this works. Huh? If you look at the two pictures on the top there, on top, the first cartoon, you see a rather narrow ribbon. That's, let's say, the nozzle of your electrospinning vehicle. And you can see a bunch of fibers, most of them kind of aligned in one direction, right? Now, the second picture underneath it, is one where the nozzle is a little bit thicker. And what you can see there is, on the side walls, the fibers are mostly aligned. But in the middle, the polymer chains are kind of wrapped up. This was known. It was known that if your radius of your nozzle 
is about the size of the gyration radius of the polymer. Gyration radius is the radius of the bowled up polymer. If the radius of your nozzle is in that range of RG, the gyration radius, you start unraveling that ball and it becomes straight lines. Then we recognize, but if this is true, I might, <coughs> sorry, I might find carbon structures that actually show the freezing of this behavior into carbon. Do you understand? The translation of that image in the middle is actually shown, shown right here. This is TEM again. Look, what do we see? We see nicely organized graphitic planes on the outside, and we see random glassy carbon in the middle, just like you would predict from the middle picture. Do you understand that? I'm not going too fast over this. Right, it comes back to why do I get graphite? I get graphite because the polymer chains, depending on their uh, gyration radius, relative to the opening of the nozzle, get you to have the polymer chain straighten out. And when they are straightened out, they translate into graphite. Do quiz me on that. Do you get this point? This is a nice insight, isn't it? It's like, uh, Louis, I thought you were asking a question, but he's just <laughs> working on the camera. Are you okay with this? Right. So, what is be behind this graphitization at 900 degrees C? Not even using a catalyst. You know, graphite formation normally should happen only at 2600 degrees C. And we get it at such low temperature. Well, there is no catalyst, but the flow induces order in electrospinning. And one controlling parameter is the ratio of the gyration radius of the polymer versus the nozzle opening. Right. In the meantime, we are going from continent to continent, right? So I showed you some progress first at IIT Kanpur, then we went to Korea, but my guys here at UC Irvine were also not sitting still. And they really the, made a real discovery, something that was published in Nano Letters, which is probably the most prestigious uh, magazine where you publish your, your results in. So what they started doing is the following. You remember when we started talking about electrospinning, I said there's a far field electrospinning and a near field. Now, in far field, what do you have? Let's see, I'll go back to an earlier cartoon on that. Well, no, I'll use this one. In far field, this bubble is about 10 to 15 centimeters away from the substrate, right? This is my substrate, and I apply a big voltage. In near field, it's very simple, what do you do? You bring your substrate much closer, like one or two millimeters away from that bubble. Now what then happens is the following. If you're not close to the bubble, the fiber here that jets out of the bubble is still straight. Right? But unfortunately, it's quite fat, and I want to make nanowires. And so now we need to put, come up with something new. How? Because if I'm that close to that bubble, I know I have control, right? Because I only have one fiber. But unfortunately, that fiber is fat. Now, if you have a fat polymer fiber, think about the chewing gum, what could you do? You could pull on it. And that's what we did. So we decided, I'm jetting this fiber to the substrate, and then I pull on the substrate. What that does, it thins the fiber, but more, no, normally, what happens, unfortunately, to the fiber, it breaks. So what do we need to do with the polymer to make it less breakable? The mechanical engineers, you will choose a material that is much more viscoelastic. Exactly. And so the invention that we came up with is near-field electrospinning, where instead of just using a field to attract the original fiber to a substrate, we pull on it. So we use mechanical forces. And we basically were able to write this way for up to an hour. So we could write this line to wherever we wanted. We touch it to the surface here, then go there, go there. So we can write a nanopolymer fiber continuously. Turns out there's a piece of equipment out there called dip pen lithography. 
It has a little bit in common to that, but like the word says, you have to dip and write, dip and write. I could write here continuously. Now comes, and this is where you guys could be of help. Where are we today? We found, interestingly enough, that the materials that are very viscoelastic, that allow you to write continuously, we cannot pyrolyze them. So, from the physics point of view, there seems to be something that's contradictory. If you have a very viscoelastic material, it doesn't lend itself easily to carbonization. Now, uh, my graduate student, Julia Canton, she's now making all type of mixtures of a viscoelastic polymer. Let's say polyethylene oxide works marvelously. Polyethylene oxide, very high molecular weight, like one million. That's very viscoelastic. So we, with that, we can write for a long, long time. But unfortunately, you try to carbonize it because I want to make these lines that I wrote with in carbon, uh, it melts, it evaporates, it burns. And so she has now found some combinations where she mixes uh, PEO, this viscoelastic material, with carbonizable materials. And she's getting there. She is now able to carbonize these lines she wrote. But unfortunately, we are not able yet to get into the 20, 10 nanometer range. Because if I could, if I can get into that range, what happens? Does anyone know? Why am I so eager to get into the below 10 nanometer range with these lines? Anyone has a guess? Why is that a big target? Independent from my sensor application. You remember the washcloth? I'll come back to that in a moment. Why would I want to go even further and get into the sub 10 nanometer range? Because I might see, it starts with a Q effect. I might see quantum, quantum effects. So there we go. I might be able, with a piece of equipment that's $10,000, $12,000, make quantum transistors. That would be something, wouldn't it? Instead of a focused IMB milling machine, it can cost a million dollars, we could actually, you know, <laughs> in the kitchen almost, make quantum devices. And so this is one of the, the big pushes in my group to get there as quickly as possible. Uh, to make these lines even thinner. So there you see a bubble. Uh, actually, if you would have a sharper image of it, you would see that out of that bubble emerges a nanoline, and that's that nanoline then that connects these posts, as you can see in the second picture from the top. What you see here, and you kind of expect that, that's the diameter of these lines, these nanolines, as a function of the speed. And you can see, the faster I write, the more I pull on it, the thinner it gets. Right? So there's a relation between thickness of the fiber uh, and speed of writing. So by the way, people that really contributed dramatically to this project, especially Gobin Bisht here, who is now at Intel. Uh, he was actually the one who built this system and was at one point actually very eager to start a company around uh, this technology. We are now hoping that someone else within the team will pick this up. So what, what, what's he able to do with this machinery? So in near field electrospinning, one expects thicker wires. You get that, right? Because we are closer to where it issues from. Uh, but we are now able to make 10 nanometer wires at voltages as low as 200 volts. Uh, you actually you can scrap C200 versus 300 volt. That's a picture. I might have it on the next slide. Let me check. Yeah, I do have it. Look, do you see what happens uh, on this picture on the right is SEM. The top part is more white, it's thicker, right? And then the bottom, bottom part thins. That is because I have changed the voltage. And I have uh, switched the voltage from 200 to 300 volts. Now, this is just the opposite from all the other electrospin ex experiments, because what you can see is that when I decrease, increase the voltage, and let me show that in graph two, actually I think I have that also graphically. Here we go, look. You can see that the diameter goes down as the voltage goes down. Now, why do you think that is? I'm gonna see if you guys followed this story. This is not so easy to answer, yes, try. Okay, it's pulling more material because of the higher voltage. 
No, so look, look. The material is approaching the plate faster, so you, if you're moving the plate at the same speed, it doesn't have as much time to stretch it and thin it out? Uh, you can just say no. It's, it is no, right? <laughs> it is no, right? But because it, it's just the opposite from what you're saying. Do you see? No, so higher voltage will pull more material faster, right? So it'll have a thicker diameter. Well, yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, I, that's actually the answer, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, if I go to lower voltage and I have the same amount of material, get less of I get less. So, fantastic, you got, that's, that's interesting, just because you turned it around, yeah, I yeah. couldn't, uh, too slow today. Yeah, that is exactly the answer. So, I'm going to say the, the way I usually see it, so when I go to 200 volts, I don't pull so much material out of that bubble. Right? And it keeps on pulling at the same rate, so I'm thinning it more. And that's exactly what we see uh, right here. When I go from that thickness there to the thinner one. And we knew we had a new technology because of this result. All the previous work uh, in near-field electrospinning that came out of UC Berkeley shows the inverse relationship. Right? And so that was important for us. Okay, I'm going to see if you guys can answer the next question. Uh, say I'm drawing this line here, right? This polymer line. And I use for that an XY plotter. Right? Now, I'm going to look in detail how does that line look like in terms of thickness. And what we saw is this. This is actually looking where the fiber comes to the end and we turn around. And then the picture there is when we look in the middle. There in the middle you can see the lines are all nicely the same uniform thickness, right? But when I go towards the end of the cycle, look what I see. Now can someone tell me why that is? Why do I see that shape? And what, as an engineer, would you do about it? Because I want to see the writing of the pattern like this, but I only have the nice uniform lines in the middle, like you see there, towards the end here, look how it looks. Why is that? Say? Yeah, and why? What happens when you have an XY stage and you're moving? And it needs to turn around. Stop and turn the direction. Yeah, what happens if you want to stop? Slow down. Slow down. Now, what happens when you slow down? So, which side is slowing down? Which side is accelerating? So, we had a problem, right? So, huh. Yeah, this works, but unfortunately, the velocity changes are reflected in the thickness of my wire. So, what do I need to do as an engineer to correct that? What would you do? Say? You're almost there. Say something simpler. Mathematically, what need, do you need to keep constant? Look, I'll show you the graph. This, what does this say? This diameter versus speed. It's as a function of speed, so I need to keep speed constant. Exactly, right? And so we actually had a, a young uh, student from Saddleback College who's now a transfer student and is at UC Berkeley, who in a very short amount of time wrote a program to have the XY stage move at constant velocity, and we had perfect wires all along. Hmm? Okay, now for something completely different. <laughs> So I told you that we wanted to investigate if this technique could lead us to structural colors. Now, to build up this story, I need to go back to one slide that I went over very quickly. You remember that I said I will come back to this, right? I told you that I can, with the same kind of setup, do either electrospinning or electrospraying. Spraying happens 
Uh, do you have some comments? Okay. Uh, so spraying happens when you change the viscosity and you end up with particles instead of fibers. And so, okay, I left it at that. It uh, was kind of intriguing. But we didn't act upon it till I met someone from the University of Vienna uh, in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia. This is a woman physicist from the University of Vienna who has the following life at this moment. For three years, she's on sabbatical to travel the jungle and find examples of biomimetics, of finding examples where nature has made structures that we could try to mimic. And we had these long, long conversations, and she was introducing me to this field of structural colors. And I will tell you kind of where we are with that, because in a short amount of time, it has led also to some really neat discoveries. So first, what is structural colors, and what does it have to do with this electrospraying? Colors in nature can either be chemical, physical, or a combination of both. You have to think about that a little bit. So chemical, a dye, you know, your t-shirts, uh, it's chemical. But it turns out a lot of the colors in nature are physical. If you look at these butterfly wings, almost all of those have a physical component to it. If you would go in there with an SEM or a TEM, you would see there are small repeating nanostructures in that wing that are such that when electromagnetic radiation interacts with these structures, they give rise to all of these colors. Hmm? So, whereas chemical colors arise through pigments, structural colors result from the interaction of light waves with a feature structure having the same order of the size as the light of the wavelength. Uh, to kind of bring that home to you guys with some uh, other examples. If you look outside, you see a white cloud. Uh, do you know why the cloud is white? What is happening there? How does that color come about? There's no paint in that cloud, right? So it's definitely not chemical. You know what it is? Yes, uh -huh, that's the definition of white. But why? You have droplets of 0.5 microns rain droplets, water droplets, and this caused something called Mie scattering, M-I-E, it's the name of a physicist, a German physicist that came up with this theory of Mie scattering. And so these droplets are of the right size to give you scattering of white light. So I will show you an example. This is the first thing we try to mimic with our electrospray. Because it's the simplest, right? We wanted to see if we can do black and white. Maybe next we'll be able to do other colors. Right? So, whereas chemical color arises through pigment, structural colors result from the interaction of light waves with the featured structure having the same order of the size as the light wavelength. So that was discovered in the 1920s by a chemical engineer called Clyde Mason. Now, Nowadays, we find nanoscale architectures in an astonishing variety of plants and animals. Actually, the same trip in Malaysia, uh, this woman physicist showed me there are certain ferns that if you bend them, you can see all different colors. Depending on how much bending you have in that fern, you can go from nice blue to green. These are all structural colors. And so, people can make these structural colors. But to make features like that, you need again these very, very expensive tools like focused iron beam milling. You know, a tool that costs millions of dollars, takes you plenty of time. So there's no way you will ever use structural colors with the current expensive vacuum kind of technology. And that's why I thought perhaps our electro spinning, especially this one, here, where I can create very inexpensively these particles of about that size. And maybe that can give me a means of a spray painting technique to make structural colors very inexpensively. So the challenge I pose to my students, and it has been done, it has been accomplished, uh, happy to say, uh, is to first try to mimic 
this butterfly here on the left. And a student last year, a student from Switzerland, EPFL, was 17 weeks in my lab. And as a farewell present, he gave me an artificial butterfly that has exactly the same color patterns as this one. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about that kind of white you get, this artificial structural colored white. You can also find it not only in the white of that butterfly, but also in this beetle here. This beetle, if you look at the, unfortunately that picture doesn't look that great, but if you see the beetle, it looks whiter than white. It looks as white as snow. Uh, would you please step out? Uh, it's very disturbing, yeah. You no, know, yeah, you. You keep on talking, both of you. Why don't you step out and continue your conversation there? Please. So, that skin is whiter than white, and what is the reason for that? So, the reason is that if you look into detail, you will find proteins of all different length scales that scatter light in all different directions of all different colors. So you will have the appearance of white. Yeah, yes, please, I'm serious. You both please step out. Yes. So, and, and the effect is me scattering, also called Tyndall scattering. It deals with scattering by objects of the same size as the incoming wavelength. Uh, and so what is that, what is the size of white light coming in, roughly? What, what sizes are we talking about? Do you know? Green light. What's the wavelength? These are things you should know. 500 nanometers? He's good, yeah. <laughs> that's green. That's uh, on the top of the uh, spectrum uh, of uh, visible light. So that means that these objects we are making must be about 500 nanometers roughly. And you remember how big these particles were that I was spraying? Right here. Oop. These are indeed about half a micron. What made me make that connection? What made me make this connection is remembering that when I do electrospraying, you see this fantastically clear white product. And so when that woman showed me that uh, beetle, I immediately said, huh, this looks so similar to what we always automatically get when we do electrospraying. And so that's why I thought, huh, maybe this is possible. Let's try to mimic the simplest structure out there, uh, create something that has black and white. And so that would be this butterfly here. You want to see on top. How does that color come about? Well, the white in the wing is created, interestingly enough, right, not by a chemical, but it's created by these little balls that you see there. Balls that are about the size of 0.5 micron, just like the rain droplets in, a, in the sky, and cause me scattering. Where the black dot is, is the same configuration, except these little balls are missing. And so I gave the student uh, that came in, and a paper is being written up uh, as we speak, this task. You take a silicon substrate and you make me that pattern, just like the butterfly, but make it with electrospraying. And he did it, uh, as I said, in just 17, 17 weeks. How did he do it? He didn't do it as I had originally thought we would be able to do it. I was going to combine this uh, cage that you see with uh, electro spinning and then filling these cages up with these little balls. It turned out it was simpler than that. He actually took SU8 that you know by now and he put in a black pigment, pigment so he cheated a little bit to make the black background and then he sprayed the particles on it to make the rest white. And he did that in the shape of that butterfly. Now I knew I had a very smart student, because when he came and showed me that, I said, prove to me it's structural color. And he, he did one thing. 
that proved there was structural color. And he had nothing, no ex you know, experimental tool, just himself, and he shows it to me, and he proves to me in one second it's a structural color. What could he have done? Bend it. What? Bend it. No, but yeah, but it's also, you would break the silicon wafer. Something else. Change the angle. No? He says spit on it. Because if there's water over this structure, it's like in a butterfly, because it's structural, the color disappears. I thought that was really cute, right? <laughs> it's like the simplest proof ever. So he could also have put on some liquid of any kind, right? Uh, but he just spit on it and voila, the color disappeared. That man has future. Uh, he actually not only proved to me in 17 weeks it was a good idea, uh, he made it into a glucose sensor. Because if you put a solution of glucose on that substrate, the refractive index changes depending on the glucose concentration and he could make it almost like a gradient. He could actually measure uh, the glucose content. Right? So, I'm finished very early today. I am sorry I got a little bit upset there, but I, I, for me, I, I put a lot of effort in these classes. And if you have people constantly talking and kind of disturbing the class, I, I don't really know why you're here. Uh, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, someone is paying a lot of money for your education, and we put a lot of effort in giving you the best possible education to just waste it uh, by chatting uh, in the class to me is childish, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't stand for it. Anyway, so conclusion, this carbon MEMS field is after 10 years, and it's actually more like 14, 15 years, uh, leading to all type of applications. I don't know if you remember some of them. I had this one summarizing slide with applications. Which application do you remember of that? Remember some of them? So we talked about batteries, right? talked about fuel cells, talked about uh, molds, etc. And then, of course, uh, the suspended nanowire can be used as a nanosensor. Uh, so the, uh, that's the second bullet point, actually. Suspended carbon nanowire-based sensors offer several advantages over other nanowire-based sensors. Do you remember some of them? I had that table justifying why I'm trying to make these suspended nanowires. Do you remember some of them? There were four or five, right? There was that table. Do you remember what, uh, why are we doing this? Capture Say it again. Capture uh, no, no, no. This, this had more to do with uh, why, first of all, a nanosensor, and then specifically why a suspended nanosensor. You remember that? A lower limit of detection, right? And why was that? Yeah, it's the surface to volume argument, right? You have so much surface for volume. The sensor always is about modifying the surface behavior. And more surface to activate a smaller bulk gives you a much higher sensitivity. Now, that would also be true if the wire is on the surface. What was the point about lifting it and make it into a telephone wire kind of device. Do you remember that? Yeah. Right, because if you have a, a sensor onto a substrate, substrate is basically dirty and ions and all type of uh, interferences will occur. If I lift it up, I don't have the solid uh, messing up the signal. There was another reason that if I lift it up and hang it uh, between two poles, you can have access from all directions, right? So it's a better mass transport to the device. And then finally, uh, this third point. At that point, I said, might be a good application for electrospinning. It should be electrospraying, right? Uh, I don't think it's might. I think we actually are well on our way of proving that this could become a very inexpensive method uh, to produce uh, structural colors. So I will not start uh, the next class. Uh, we made plenty of progress, but I have some time for questions. Uh, this PowerPoint will also be put on the web, of course, and videos I think you have up to class eight now. So probably by tonight we have class nine up, right, Lewis?
and then class 10, which is the one of today, very shortly thereafter. Any questions? By the way, I have not seen any one of you yet for uh, uh, office hours, so I just want to remind you the office hours are always on Wednesdays between 11 and 12. If I'm not there, uh, Swati is there to take questions. Uh, I actually will definitely try to give you your homework uh, next week, Monday. Because I, I yeah, I know. Yes, can someone remind me what was the, the other question we were adding on to his list? Is it the sparking effect on not hurting the tool in EDM? Yeah. Was that the, the, the additional one? Right. Okay, uh, let me, why don't we finalize it now? So, the additional question I would like you to answer is the following. If you look at carbon MEMS, could you describe the carbon MEMS in terms of all of the manufacturing categories? Remember, additive, subtractive, batch, etc. So the question is, describe carbon MEMS with all of these different categories of manufacturing. Is it thermal machining? Is it uh, laser machining? Is it uh, batch, uh, continuous, etc.? Could you do that? So we'll make that as the last question. So, uh, uh, Andrew, I have to say Drew, right? Andrew? Uh, can you send that to me? I'll edit it and then I'll give you your class assignment, homework, uh, maybe by tonight, perhaps by tomorrow. And then if you could get it to us uh, next week, Thursday. Right? And then for the midterm, we already said it's May the 9th, I think, right? Very good. Okay. Thank you, guys.